Well, I can tell you as uh, my value investing background, it's all about mental models. Charlie Munger really kind of popularized the the term of, of having these mental models. I know Shane Parrish does a lot with it as well. And going through the book, I've I've read a lot of books through the years that talk about these mental models. But as I was going through your book, I was like, wow, I'm learning a lot that some that I've heard the term, but really just didn't know what it was. And then others that I've never even heard of before that have just really kind of helped me conceptualize ideas in, in the Bitcoin space. Hey, everyone, welcome to the show. I'm here with Anil. Uh, Anil, you wrote this amazing book. Uh, my, my first welcome to the show, <laughs> I guess we'll start there. Um, where I want to start is, uh, what inspired you to write this? Because this is a really unique, this is different than, than other books in the space and different in a very good way. But I, I want to hear from you. What were you trying to accomplish with this? Absolutely. Thanks for having me on the show. Um, yeah, you already, you already nailed it there it was different there yeah. are a lot of fantastic books out there that cover so many different aspects of the very complex topic that is bitcoin and i'm going to level with you and this is not me being humble um i'm an idiot <laughs> i needed <laughs> to force myself to yes. go through this process yeah to understand bitcoin from first principles um so i wrote this book for myself as a project and I love this in, doing so. Yeah. In the beginning, this is exactly what you said. I wrote this. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't write this for you. I wrote this for myself. And, and when I read that, I was like, that is so awesome to, to just state up front because you were, you were on a journey, you were on a mission to, to learn and teach yourself all this stuff. It's fascinating. It's awesome. Yeah, and I'm at a point in life where I've got two young kids and limited bandwidth. Mm -hmm. So I, know there are other people out there like me who can't walk around with 50 different frameworks and mental models in their head. So how could I condense it in a way that someone can just pick up a book when they hear a particular uh, term or keyword, mm -hmm. flick through the pages and get what they need at a very high level. You know, this mm -hmm. is not a dense book, mm -hmm. but at a very high level and, and be able to move through whatever else they're already consuming. Well, I can tell you as uh, my value investing background, it's all about mental models. Charlie Munger really kind of popularized the the term of, of having these mental models. I know Shane Parrish does a lot with it as well. And going through the book, I've, I've read a lot of books through the years that talk about these mental models. But as I was going through your book, I was like, wow, I'm learning a lot that some that I've heard the term, but really just didn't know what it was. And then others that I've never even heard of before that have just really kind of helped me conceptualize ideas in, in the Bitcoin space that I'd never even thought about before. And we're going to go through some of those today. Uh, but one, one other compliment I got for you on the book, uh, when people are doing a book, sometimes doing graphics can really be a pain in the butt because it's just, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a, a, a lot of work to kind of, uh, make it accessible and to organize it. It's just easier to kind of bang out the text. And this book is amazing in the, in the graphical layout and the pictures that go along with these mental models that you're describing to make it accessible. Like, uh, did you have a background in design or did you just, uh, link up with somebody who's like really good at design work in order to make this so accessible? No. So I have zero training in design. Wow. Um, my dad was, a, a graphic designer, so I kind of grew up around it, oh, but no oh. formal training. Yeah. Um, but I think it kind of came again from that forcing yourself to condense information into mm. a way where you have to strip away everything that's unnecessary. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, what I really like to do is I would give a lot of presentations, um, in previous, uh, careers. And I kind of carried that maybe skill set into explaining Bitcoin. And, you know, something that, um, I do a lot is I doodle on post-it notes. So, okay, here, here's an example. Um, if you're giving a, a talk or a presentation uh -huh. and you're going to use visual aids, um, they have to be very simple mm -hmm. so that an audience can take them in while they're also listening to what you're saying, the information mm -hmm. you're giving them. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, you really want to be able to communicate whatever you're trying to show on something about this size, Mm -hmm. you know, using something like a Sharpie from about this far away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, and I like to, you know, let's just say like a Venn diagram, Mm -hmm. if you can't communicate something as simply as this, you don't understand it well enough to be trying to teach someone. And then you're so, just treating it in a layers. You're just stepping down. So after they understand the the broader, larger concept, then you're stepping down into the next layer, layer two of the idea, and you're making that accessible. I love it. Um, and boy, does it come through in the book for people that are looking for something that talks about a lot of mental models and ideas and paradoxes that lay them out in a in an accessible kind of way. I I love this. I will reference this on my shelf. Um, Okay, so let's thank get, you. I, <laughs> I, sorry, I, really I, just, I just have to say, I, I really, you know, uh, appreciate that coming from you. Yeah. Um, when when the book actually came out, I was terrified because it came out at the same time as Gladstein's new book, um, as Knut's book. Um, who else? Someone else had a book coming out. And I'm just <laughs> thinking, like, I feel like that indie director that's trying to have their opening weekend at the same time as like Ridley Scott and Scorsese. So, you know, to hear that from you just means a lot. You know, I have a huge oh, amount I mean of respect it. for you. I mean it, man. Uh, so here we'll go through this. So, um, when we, when, when you're going through the book and you look back at the experience and it's been a little bit of time since you probably finished, uh, your, your last, uh, sentence in the book, uh, what, really kind of sticks out in your mind as uh, maybe your favorite or something that while you were going through this self-discovery of, of writing this, that you're just like, wow, something like really clicked. Which one of these uh, paradoxes or theories or mental models, if you will, was one that stuck out for you? For me, it's definitely creative destruction. I don't even have to think about it. That to me, uh, personally, I think the most people would be the most useful thing to understand Mm. to make sense of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I cut my teeth in the music industry Mm. back in the early 2000s, 2010s, and I could see things happening all over the place from, you know, we had the rise of MP3s and CD burners completely changing the economics of the music industry. Now bands had to tour, you know, tickets were going digital from, lighting up at your physical box office, uh, StubHub launched. Um, you know, if you wanted to make it as a band, you had to pay attention to social media and YouTube. So I could see all these forces around me reshaping this industry that for a very long time had existed in a very similar form, Mm -hmm. but I didn't know how to explain what was going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So understanding creative destruction that, you know, technology will continue to evolve. Mm -hmm. You know, humans are ingenious creatures. Mm -hmm. We're going to find better, faster, cheaper, smarter ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. And that's going to have real world consequences. So, you know, for me at that point in my life, I was looking around thinking, I don't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. I have to stop what I'm doing. Uh, I ended up going back to school because of it. Um, just because uh, I felt completely out of my depth by not understanding the the process of creative destruction. Hmm. When you when we talk about creative destruction with Bitcoin, I I look at it from a just a macroeconomics lens, and and you look at the fiat system, and you look at how it just props up the, the zombie is is really kind of the the term that everybody uses the zombie companies, and it doesn't allow for creative destruction to occur. Um, when you look at Bitcoin's progress uh, after the past 10 years and, and where it potentially goes here in the, in the coming 10 years, how do you see the creative destruction uh, getting better? Does it take time for Bitcoin to actually do its thing to, to force creative destruction upon the market? Uh, what are some of your thoughts on just like what's happened to date and kind of where we're going with respect to creative destruction? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Bitcoin kind of provides the solution. Um, I I guess, firstly, we could look out at the world and survey all these different 
industries. So mm-hmm. I kind of mentioned the music industry. Mm-hmm. Um, you could look at education at the moment. You could look at, um, I mean, software's impacted so many industries across the board, mm-hmm. but one that's always been maybe immune to that because of the monopoly powers of governments and the central banking um, cartel is uh, their power over the issuance and transmission of value. Uh, so Bitcoin has been so successful because it's uh, kind of come from the ground up. It's a, It's been a grassroots effort. Mm-hmm. So it was very difficult to detect in its early days, you know, how much of a serious threat it was. And then it also happens to be decentralized in a way that makes it uh, almost impossible to shut down. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty much indestructible. And mm-hmm. that's really the key property you need in something that's going to challenge a system like that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Bitcoin doesn't need to be the fanciest, shidiest, fastest thing out there. Um, and I think this is something Michael Saylor talks a lot about is it just needs to be indestructible. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this is a very unique situation where innovation is usually not welcomed mm-hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, the creation of private forms of money mm-hmm. in, in the fiat era. So Bitcoin just does it in a way that cannot be shut down. Yeah, um, It does it in a way that's very hard to detect. Uh, and it did it in a way in the early days where it appeared to be a novelty. It was almost treated as a toy. Mm-hmm. So it had this perfect uh, path to to get to where it is today, which is, you know, half a trillion dollars, um, millions of people around the world interact with it on a daily basis. Uh, so I'm very optimistic that, that Bitcoin is the thing that forces creative destruction uh, on the central planning of the monetary system. Uh, one of the paradoxes that you bring up in the book that I was not familiar with before reading this was Jevon's paradox. Can you describe what this is and then how it applies to Bitcoin? Yes. Uh, firstly, everything mentioned in the book, you know, these are not obviously my own original ideas. It comes from reading another book um, from someone smarter than me and realizing this is very important and it mm-hmm. applies to Bitcoin beautifully. Mm-hmm. So Jevon's paradox uh, really explains that as we get more efficient at extracting a particular uh, source of energy, you know, let's just say whether that's coal or oil or what have you, um, or we get more efficient in using it in terms we we get more um, out of it uh, and make the most of its energy density, well, obviously the um, cost per unit of it, of it is going to go down. Uh, and what does that do to demand? Usually, you know, if oil was $1 a barrel, uh, would we be using more or less energy? Yeah, more. And, you know, Vaclav Smil, so this is this is kind of the book that mm-hmm. really walks through the whole process. For me, this is like the Bitcoin standard of energy, is, mm. is energy and civilization. Um, and one key point to take away from the book is that every transition in terms of like the primary energy source that a society uses uh, is driven by making the previous source abundant, Mm, mm -hmm. which comes from declining costs in a very rapid fashion usually. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, we would never have progressed to extracting oil unless um, we used massive amounts of coal through uh, steam powered engines that helped extract oil, Mm -hmm. you know, and that was only possible because the price of coal declined so much because we got so much more efficient at using it. And coal only became possible because we got so good at using wood as an energy source. Um, so every, every major energy transition is powered by making the previous source of energy abundant. It's, it's interesting because, uh, you have all these articles that come out of like the WEF and you name it publication for the past five to 10 years talking about how Bitcoin is going to consume all the energy in the world by in the, and then the, the date they provide is like two years later. Like we've already passed multiple times when they've said it's going to consume all the electricity in, in the world. And, uh, 
not only do they not understand the tech advancements that are happening because of Moore's law and the, the rigs becoming more efficient, but I really don't think that they understand this principle that you just mentioned, this Javon's uh, paradox uh, moving forward. And there's just, there's so many mental models that are broke in the world uh, when people are looking at it, looking at Bitcoin superficially, but when you really do the work like you did in, in, in going through this book, um, it's it's fascinating to see all these paradox like like this one that just uh require people to go a, a level deeper and maybe even two levels deeper to really kind of understand why a lot of these narratives that are just kind of flung around on these you know clickbait type uh <laughs> mediums uh to uh, they're just shot to 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 pieces but um yeah, and that's probably a good actually uh, segue into there's, there's there's one one concept in the book that really summarizes just about everything mm-hmm. else in it and everything we're probably going to talk about mm-hmm. in terms of our frustration with those clickbait narratives mm-hmm. that that kind of um, get put out there, and that's this idea of um, uh, the gel man amnesia effect, mm-hmm. and it was a it's a very obscure term, but it was coined by um, the author, Michael Crichton, if you're familiar with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the basic idea is, uh, if you read something, a piece of information, usually journalism, like you just mentioned that, that, uh, uh, wonderful article that came from the WEF that Bitcoin would consume all the world's energy by 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, and that does not happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have like this data point now piece of evidence that shows that was incorrect Mm -hmm. and you go back and you look at the logic they used uh, to make that assertion. Well, if they're not kind of thinking from first principles, like put aside the agenda they may have, but Mm -hmm. if they're not giving you uh, information that has been, you know, thoroughly researched and is defensible in its logic, then that's almost a sign you should disregard whatever else they say Mm -hmm. because you won't be able to, verify if it's accurate or not, especially mm-hmm. in areas where you're not an expert, mm-hmm. you know, so outside of Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, in the digital age where you're trying to curate your own information diet, uh, look out for those red flags mm-hmm. because the tighter and tighter you can get your funnel to a group of people, usually individuals, not, you know, large publishing entities, um, but a group of individuals who are clear thinkers where that's proven to you with evidence over time, um, the clearer your thinking will become, the better or easier it is for you to just tune out the noise uh, and focus on what's actually going on at a fundamental level. So, so, so in, that's, in, in finance, there's so many people that I follow that are wrong all the time. And, but I think the, to, to your point, the, one of the reasons I continue to follow some of them is, is mostly because of their humility to admit like, Hey, I was just dead wrong about this. And this is, and then they almost like do a recap on what it is that they missed. Like that's a thinker. And that's a person that, uh, I'm just not going to write off and say, yeah, I'm not going to listen to anything they say, but that humility that's matched with being wrong is the thing that I really think sets a lot of uh, like great thinkers and and forecasters and people that are coming up with mental models on what they think is going to happen in the world uh, to wh- whether you keep following <laughs> what they're saying or not. Is is there anything else that you would that you would say beyond that is as far yeah. as just not like writing somebody off just because they're wrong once? Um, how yeah, do we I'm guard against you. that? I'm with you 100 percent. It's, you know, everyone's going to be wrong most of the time it's was the rationale behind your decision uh coming from a place of like critical thinking and sound logic Mm -hmm. uh you know sometimes you will make the best decision in a situation the outcome will be unfavorable or negative Mm -hmm. but given the information you had and the environment you were in you made the best possible decision Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah you should be wrong most of the time uh, but like you said, are you humble enough to, you know, lower your ego and take it as a learning opportunity? Um, there's a section in the book, uh, dedicated to network effects. Talk to us about, uh, this and why this is important. Every new technology that gets adopted at a 
significant enough scale that it becomes a uh, you know core piece of how we live our lives gets there by way of network effects. You know, it doesn't just get introduced or dropped into the world like a, a central bank digital currency. Um, it it grows with time because it offers something useful to its users, and that usefulness increases exponentially with each marginal additional user. Uh, so you could take the example of the telephone, really simple one. Um, you and I have a telephone. Great. We can communicate. We throw an extra person into the mix. Well, now we have three um, individual lines of communication. Add in one more. Well, it doesn't just go to four. You know, it goes up to six. And you continue that trend onwards. And it's the same with Bitcoin in the sense that uh, the benefit to me of using Bitcoin with each additional user, it increases beyond just having one more person in that group. Mm -hmm. Because now we've introduced another human with a unique set of skills, a unique set of values, um, who is going to provide value to that economy um, in a way that benefits the whole system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you kind of see this trend now where um, people will only sell their goods or services for Bitcoin. Um, and the way you get Bitcoin from someone is you have to create more value uh, or enough value, sorry, that encourages them to part with their Bitcoin. Uh, so the way I see it is you have this fiat system on one side and you have this Bitcoin circular economy growing on the other. One is creating an ever-growing pie and the other one is very much zero-sum and full of conflict. So, yeah, uh, I think we're on a very um, clear path with Bitcoin in terms of its adoption, mirroring what we've seen with the adoption of other major communications technologies. People that aren't uh, investors in tech or um, they're, they're more of the, the Buffett style, like really not looking at any of these like emerging technology type companies as, as being investable. I think this is one of the things that they often really miss um, is just the power of, of network effects. I was listening to an interview with Trace Mayer is probably 2015 timeframe. And he published this, uh, this article on just network effects. It had been nothing I'd ever thought about before, before seeing this. And it was, it was very, very influential to me, really wrapping my head around how profound Bitcoin could potentially be. And so he had, uh, he had seven network effects back then. And this is just for people just kind of to maybe do some research if they're interested in network effects more, but the seven that, that, that trace listed back then was one speculation. He was saying that because of the speculation, um, it's going to attract more people into Bitcoin because the price was actually so volatile and, and violent. Uh, the next one was merchant adoption, which you talked a little bit about there. consumer adoption, uh, the security features he said would, would turn into a network effect, which we're, we're starting to see that more now, uh, developer mind share. He's saying, because you have some of the best developers in the world, it actually creates a further network effect of people building on top of Bitcoin. You're really seeing that on like layer two, uh, and whatnot with lightning liquid, other things. Uh, now with the ordinals, you could look at that and say that that's a, another network effect that's just going to compound on on Bitcoin. The financialization piece um, that uh, we, we're seeing that in derivatives and everything else, and that's a huge network effect that's that's really picking up in the last uh, two to three years. And then his his final network effect was just the adoption of it becoming a world reserve currency. And when we look at around the world today with all the, the debate between net consumers and net producers and them not being able to, to really kind of come to an agreement on a settlement layer of using dollars, euros, and, and exchanging like raw molecules and materials for, for those things, you can see how that's now like literally coming to the fold. And he, he wrote about this, what, seven, eight years ago, like, um, I'm curious yeah, if there's more and, more network effects that he would say now, but you know he's he's nowhere to be found. But um, I'm I'm curious if you have any uh, thoughts or additional uh, points to that. 
and ill. Yeah, well, just the fact that he wrote that uh, in 2015, and there are you know other thinkers like you know Pierre Richard or Michael Goldstein who who are putting out these incredible pieces mm-hmm. so long ago, yeah. with such incredible foresight mm-hmm. that that what is what kind of drew me into the space in a very serious manner mm-hmm. was thinking here are these incredibly smart people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I cannot fault their logic. Um, and they're all heading in one direction. And that is focusing on Bitcoin and its monetization path. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I feel like we've got all these amazing uh, sort of signposts in our past in in terms of like the Bitcoin educational content that came out that a, a lot of the work's been done for us and all those those that hard thinking has been done for us if you're able to uh you know figure out who are the people providing that signal um uh, another one that you bring up in the in the book is this idea of re- reflexivity uh i know george soros wrote an entire book on this idea um explain what this is and then explain to people how it applies to bitcoin in particular so the concept of reflexivity uh, drills down to the individual that in a, let's say a free market, um, you have a number of thinking participants. They're going to come in with their own views, experiences, perspective, uh, capital, risk tolerance, and they're going to be swayed by their own unique set of biases. So that inherently is going to introduce volatility into any market. Now you couple that with something like Bitcoin that is being monetized from zero. And I think that just kind of compounds even more so. So the idea of understanding reflexivity in the context of Bitcoin is really uh, a way to understand um, Bitcoin's highly cyclical nature through these boom and bust cycles that we see, which is, you know, people get very, um, overly uh, optimistic about its future during um, booms. And that kind of plays into itself, creating this positive feedback loop. And we see the same thing on the way down. Now, the important thing to understand is we cannot differentiate between um, what factors are causing that. Mm. You know, is it someone's um, views over what's going to happen or is it the momentum of the market playing back into the individuals uh, in that kind of feedback loop fashion? So, yeah, I really just personally use it as a way to make sense of Bitcoin's volatility in that kind of multi-year cyclical fashion. I mean, really, it just smashes the efficient market hypothesis uh, to like shreds. It's, it's really kind of like the idea of reflexivity is just like saying that this is, there's no way this can be valid for, you know, any quantity of time that you would measure it between, right? Yeah, and the benefit in understanding it is that if you choose to use Bitcoin as your long-term savings vehicle, is you can tune out that volatility. Mm. Um, because you understand that's just the natural course that's going to happen yes. given the inputs. Yeah, and, and uh, just to add to that, I would say the, the more that you get derivatives stood up around Bitcoin, uh, it only uh, enhances that, that volatility and that, that dissidence that you have between uh, rational acting parties, parties that don't have enough information, that, that are acting and thinking that they're rational, and and all the mix in between right um hey so you talk you have a great section in here it's one of your longer sections that that you talk about uh the laws of thermodynamics um you have a outstanding quote from lynn alden uh she's you have her quoted as saying consensus mechanisms that don't involve work instead involve governance uh, talk to us about the importance of the quote. Talk to us why this section was was one of your larger sections in the book and why you think it's important to Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, Lynn just nails it in that in that quote. You know that that'll save you reading several books. Uh, <laughs> true, true. Yeah, the the whole point of 
of Bitcoin is to remove third parties from exchanges of value and the issuance of Mm -hmm. money. Um, And you can only do that if there is some kind of work or effort involved in both those things, Mm -hmm. either the issuance of currency or the validation of transactions. Mm -hmm. Now, if you choose not to go down that route, which is, you know, something that's quite um, verifiable, you can have uh, very transparent rules around it and everyone's on the same footing. Uh, The other direction is governance, Mm -hmm. which is basically the fiat system and you're putting all those responsibilities uh, on the shoulders of a select group of individuals. Mm -hmm. You can choose whoever you want those individuals to be. You can choose however uh, they decide on um, particular uh, decisions, but you've introduced moral hazard into it. Humans, uh, given a long enough time frame uh, and the ability to influence things at that level of society, you know, like the, the base money of a society, uh, you're just asking for trouble. Mm-hmm. So I kind of see those, you know, two polar opposites really as Bitcoin and everything else, you know, not just the fiat system, but also other, um, I guess, digital currencies uh, trying to compete with Bitcoin, but they're, they're very separate things. So it's really going back to proof of work. Hey everyone, it's Clay Fink here. Are you looking for an investment opportunity in a $2 trillion market? Look no further than Atacama, the cybersecurity industry's latest game changer. Atacama has opened its doors to US accredited and international investors alike, already attracting over 5,000 investors and $6.5 million in capital. Atacama's recurring revenue model saw 10x revenue expansion in 2022 alone. They have patented technology and large contracts secured, including one with the U.S. Department of Defense. This is a limited time opportunity to get in on the ground floor of a rapidly growing cybersecurity startup. To learn more, simply visit invest.atacama.com slash WSB. That is invest.atacama, A-T-A-K-A-M-A dot com slash WSB. Full disclosure, I have personally invested in Atacama's equity crowdfunding round at a $29 million valuation. Please keep in mind that investments in early stage companies do contain risk. As with any investment, crowdfunding investments do offer attractive potential upside, but they cannot offer any guarantees of a future return. I, I even try to, uh, like, I, I agree with Lynn's quote all day long. I thoroughly believe in proof of work, but I also try to, like, uh, challenge the idea, right? And so um, one of the better challenges that I've heard to to the idea, which I don't agree with, but just to kind of throw it out there for the audience to kind of decide for themselves is, so after you get all of the Bitcoin, the 21 million issued, why is proof of work still required after it's already been uh, issued completely out into the market? And the, the, to counter that argument, I would personally, and I'm, I'm curious if you would agree with this, Anil, is just... Um, think of like all the all the 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 21 million sitting in a vault there should be some type of work that's required to protect everything that's the 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 interactions that are happening inside of that vault it shouldn't just be that the people that hold the most coins can just sit there and get fat dumb and happy on transaction fees by literally doing nothing like it's not incentivizing it's not in- incentivizing the recycling of the coins, I guess that, that that's how I would describe the fee structure at that point when all the, the coins are issued into the market into the strongest and fittest and most efficient hands uh, in a free and open market. Whereas by continuing to have proof of work there, you are now incentivizing the miners to find, to go out and literally find the cheapest and most efficient energy on the planet, moving their rigs, moving themselves, uh, performing this this demonstration in the in this ecosystem that um, they truly are the the fittest and that they truly are the most efficient actor to reallocate that capital into the market. Um, 
I don't know how else to kind of like combat that argument that people would say. And and I think that you would probably get now ETH's uh ETH is not pegged like the the amount of coins. Like we have no idea how many coins are even there or where that's ever going to end. But I heard people making that argument like we don't really need proof of work anymore because most of the coins are already issued and that was under proof of work and that's why we can now just transition to proof of stake. But um, I'm curious if if you agree with it or if you see it different or maybe you have a different way of describing. Yeah. I don't know that I did the best job describing <laughs> my counterpoint well, to the argument, but well, let's imagine that you're trying to move a uh, hundred million dollars mm-hmm. in equivalent Bitcoin units at this point in time. Um, you probably want some level of confidence around the finality of that transaction. Mm -hmm. You're free to choose. You could choose to use the Bitcoin network. You could choose to use XYZ network. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I think the market is deciding, um, is demonstrating which one it values more just by how much value was transacted Mm -hmm. via it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I completely agree with you. Um, I know which one one I would pick. And the fees aren't going to be that high, even for a hundred million uh, movement, right? Like in, in comparison to the the value that you're transacting, right? Um, okay, uh, here's another one that that I was not well versed on. Uh, Gall's law, um, and then I'll I'll read a quote after you're kind of done describing it for people so that they can kind of understand it. The Gall's law is the idea of first building a system that is functional uh, before you choose to add bells and whistles to it or iterate on it. You want to have a very strong foundation, Mm -hmm. um, especially when we're talking about monetary systems Mm -hmm. and, you know, make no mistake, Bitcoin is money. So imagine you're building a house. Uh, How important is the foundation or the stability of that foundation to you? I guess is the question. Mm -hmm. Um, If it's not that important to you, by all means, you know, go crazy, be innovative. Um, But what Bitcoin gave us is a very strong, uh, verifiably strong foundation that then allows us to innovate on top of it without causing any um, permanent damage to that underlying foundation. You can kind of innovate without that risk. Now, if you choose to build a system where the kind of base of it is not yet functional or is still a work in progress, and you're adding all kinds of things on top of it, I mean, imagine a tower of Jenga blocks that is only supported by a single block. Mm -hmm. Um, The more complexity you add into that system uh, before first getting it stable and functional, you're just adding more risk. Mm-hmm. on top of it. Mm-hmm. So it really comes down to risk uh, and introducing unknown or unknowable risk into a system by by adding complexity on top of it. I think this one is so important and so lost on so many people that arrive to Bitcoin and, or the digital asset space. They're, they look at it and they say, they look at the complexity, especially from a software standpoint, and they're like, well, just put it all together. Like, why not? Why does it have to go in these really small modular chunks and that, that that have to be built upon? And it's it's crazy because when you look at physical reality, you see this everywhere that uh, we build in layers. Clear down to like building a skyscraper, right? Like you got the concrete. Well, why why don't you use glass, the glass windows, the material of glass windows for the concrete, right? Like we have to build in layers to optimize for the things that that uh, we desire and, and for the utility of what we're trying to do. Uh, I was in Miami and, and Brandon Quint- Quittum gave me a, a book uh, called Entangled Life. And... One of the most mind-blowing books I've ever uh, come across because it's talking about like forests and it's talking about how these plants are using the fungi underneath of the soil to use as a communication layer with the other plants and the way that they're they're literally transacting energy, they're transacting materials with each other, and it's this whole like complex 
uh, network, almost like the trees are the web pages and the fungi underneath or are the hyperlinks between the trees. And it's just, it's totally blowing my mind. And when I think of this law, this Gaul's law that you're talking about, like why didn't the trees just develop the, uh, the, the material that the fungi basically offer the trees to conduct this, yeah. this communication exchange and energy exchange between each other? It's, it's because you have to build in layers. Nature's demonstrated time and time again that we've got to build in layers in order to make sure that, that we don't breach the security or the integrity of doing too much at one spot, right? So uh, I love yeah. this in, in your book. It was fantastic. Yeah, and Brandon's really done the work on that. You yeah. know, he's someone who's taken a passion in his life, compared it to Bitcoin, found out what rules or laws from nature translate. Mm -hmm. And he's written some brilliant, brilliant pieces that, that kind of make that link. So I'd encourage anyone to go and check out his work. Yeah. Brilliant guy. Great guy. Um, so in your book, you have a quote on this one that I'm just going to read for people to, to really kind of give the, the reinforcement on what you're talking about. So Alan Farrington, another just brilliant thinking thinker in the space. He said, cramming all the features of lightning, liquid, discrete log contracts, RGB, and so on into the main chain is just an obvious bad idea. It would introduce unknowable attack vectors and hence a uh, holistic fragility to the layer one network. So love this. I think this is a really important one, but we're leading up to my favorite one that I saw in the book. Uh, here it is. Teach us about uh, intransigent minority, uh, what it is, why this applies to Bitcoin. Truly my favorite model in this book. And I had, I had never read about this before until now. So teach us. Yeah, first of all, this is a, uh, a concept popularized by Taleb. Um, and, uh, I know many Bitcoiners don't always feel that, uh, uh, great about acknowledging him, but I think this is an idea we should absolutely preserve and use for our own understanding. And the idea around the intransigent minority is think of Bitcoiners and how willing they would be once understanding Bitcoin to accept an alternative unit of account to measure um, economic value or even denominate their own savings in at this point. Um, you're just not going to get them to change. They've already made the switch. You know, they've left that ship permanently. And so now you have a group of Bitcoiners who are unwilling to change their unit of account. Uh, and you that number's growing over time. You know, we can visibly see that. So what is likely to happen? Uh, if the friction is low enough for someone outside of that group to offer, say, goods or services um, in both denominations, for example, they can still serve their fiat customers, but now they can also serve um, customers who exclusively operate in the Bitcoin world uh, and the friction is low enough, why would they not do that? They now have access to this entire new group of potential uh, customers, trading partners, whatever you want to call them. Um, so over time, that small group of individuals not only grows, but it forces its preference on the rest of the system um, because there's just very little risk or cost for others outside of it to cater to that group. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we're seeing that. Um, and part of that is because Bitcoin is just a superior unit of account, um, especially one thing I try to keep tabs on because it's really interesting to me is the insurance industry. Mm. You know, how many Bitcoiners do you think would want to have a life insurance policy payout denominated in Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. Now take out the counterparty risk part of it, but just try and think of that, that example. Um, you know, it, it, it benefits both parties. Mm -hmm. uh, why would they not do that eventually if, you know, the regulatory barrier is lower enough to allow that? So I, I feel like we're going to see this play out in many different industries where people will want to serve Bitcoiners and they'll be able to do so because the tools to do that are uh, just very easy to implement. 
you had a great uh, one sentence line uh, in this section in your book, and I'm just going to read it to folks. You said, when a few individuals shape the preferences of the majority by their unwillingness to submit to the default option, like this describes me to a T, <laughs> like how I, how I view Bitcoin, how I view it as like people, you know, they get involved in politics and they're saying, oh, I'm going to vote this way or I'm going to vote that way. And, and I'm like, I'm voting with my Bitcoin and I refuse to, uh, to sell it. And I guess it's yeah. just, uh, and I think there's a lot of other people in Bitcoin that feel the exact same way. Like they, they are going to beat that drum until the rest of the world begins to dance to, to uh or bend to their their desires yeah. right which is we are going to use this as our ledger yeah and that's not us being jerks it's we've experimented with something we've had you know positive outcomes because of it or impacts in the rest of our life um and you know now i want to help others kind of come onto that that lifeboat because i feel or believe that they'll see similar results in other aspects of their life. Yeah. I think the reason you see so many people that like, once they finally do the hard work and, and educate themselves on what it actually is, they're looking at it as a tool that I know when I buy this and I save in this, that it can't be debased no matter what. And once you come to that realization and, and truly understand why it can't be debased, because of the full nodes and all the game theory that's around it. Um, it becomes a really powerful thing of just thinking about all your hard work and everything that you're doing and just being able to freeze it into these units that, you know, this, some outside entity can't just make up more of. And I, I don't know, like it, it just doesn't seem like there's anything more important that I could possibly try to educate or work on in my life than making sure that the most amount of people in the world can participate in such a system that they're not going to be, you know, debased to the tune of trillions of units on a whim. Uh, but yeah, I, I really Absolutely. like this one. Yeah. I love this one. This is so important. Thank you. Yeah. And it's just, look, it's an opportunity for us to uh, help protect just the most productive members of society. Yes. Yes. I love that. Uh, what's something that you think the community, the Bitcoin community can do better right now? So, I mean, look, I, I don't think there is a Bitcoin community. There's a lot of individuals with different preferences, beliefs. Um, and I think just a lot of the clear rational thinkers of the world have become Bitcoiners over time. Um, if, you know, a, a lot of my time now and I think this is true for most other people who have adopted Bitcoin is spending time educating those they love yes. people around them, their family, um, and how to best to go about doing that. <laughs> and what I think without being annoying, uh, right? Is that <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> what, what most of us miss is we're trying to bring logic to an emotional, uh, mm -hmm. discussion. Mm hmm. And I would maybe encourage people to try to bring more emotion to that conversation mm -hmm. because that's what enables change. And that will only come if you can pinpoint someone's source of pain or friction in their life. Yeah. Until you can validate that emotion with them, uh, not for them, but with them they're not going to listen to you about making some fundamental change of how they live their life mm -hmm. or how they choose to denominate their life savings. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to earn their trust. Mm -hmm. And one great way to do that is just demonstrate your values. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that was obvious to me in the early days is I'm just watching all these Bitcoiners uh, live a lower stress life. Mm -hmm. They were fitter than me. They were happier than me. They had better relationships. What, was going on mm -hmm. you know i was curious enough thankfully to kind of pursue that question but it was through them demonstrating a life that was you know worthy of imitation mm -hmm. that i took the leap mm. you know they didn't have to shout down my you know throat or throw facts in my face uh it was just obvious yeah so yeah what's sad is is 
the parties that are sometimes using a, aggression and I'm not saying like physical aggression, I'm just saying argumentative aggression. They come off really strong. I think most of them are doing it from a, from a place of just deep love for family members or whatever. But they're, what they don't realize is it's, it's a total turnoff to the person who's just not mentally there or they can't even understand the, the problem that's being solved. And so then it just turns into conflict and it actually pushes the person away. Um, yes. it, it performs the exact opposite of what they're trying to accomplish, right? And um, I don't know how we can get through to people. Like you've, you've got to, it has to be more passive. It has to be more like, let me lead through through example as opposed to lead through force or lead, lead through inspiration to the others uh but but at the same time how do you extract all the knowledge that's really kind of required for somebody to get it and to be able to uh sit through the volatility because they get it um is just what makes it so difficult and um I wish I had a turnkey solution to it, but I don't. I don't know that there is. <laughs> you I don't do. Know that there it's, is. it's called a podcast, Preston. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many people that I would love to just be able to, like, you know, give a turnkey here, yeah. man. Like here, it just this unlocks like the the whole breadth of everything that you really need to know and understand. Yeah, it. but that's that's part of it too. I, you know, you still do, and used to think that way, um, but then just through redirecting my focus on the people who are already um at a point where they're open-minded enough mm -hmm. to listen or to take that leap or eager to learn more mm -hmm. um, and then i've met a whole new group of people that i now love and admire and respect through that yeah. so you know i just feel that's the 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 less uh just the more frictionless road to take mm -hmm. um do you have a favorite book or something or a book that like has really influenced you and just maybe made you look through the, look at the world through maybe a different lens besides your own book, which is phenomenal, <laughs> but Thank anything you, you want to highlight? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's one that had a pretty profound impact on me and, um, taking down a number of mental blocks that were stopping me from maybe um, fully adopting Bitcoin mm -hmm. when I still had questions around, well, maybe the state would come up with something equally as useful. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and that was really understanding the process of innovation. Mm -hmm. um, and Matt Ridley wrote this fantastic book called how innovation works. Mm. Um, you know, I, I really try to reread it uh, as often as possible. And it's just, it's a very easy read. It's just a lot of historical examples of how the process of innovation occurred. And, you know, you, you read the book, you go through all these examples of uh, really groundbreaking um, discoveries uh, or, you know, innovations that turned into technology we use in our day-to-day -day lives now. And in very few scenarios was the state involved. It usually came from individuals hammering away um, usually as part of a, a group, um, they weren't doing it for the money or the fame. Um, and it was very much, you know, grassroots movements that, that eventually took off because they just offered value to society in a way that hadn't before. Um, so it really just changed my thinking of how the future will be shaped, um, and who is going to lead that. That was so called encourage uh, people. Yeah, that was called how innovation works. Is that right? How, how innovation, innovation works, works by uh, Matt, Matt Ridley. Ridley. Okay, and then you held up another one on the energy front. What was the name of that one? Uh, yeah, that's no? called um, uh, Energy and Civilization: a History by Vaclav Smil. Yeah, that looks really good as well. Sorry, I'm I'm literally writing these down because I got a long drive on my hands over the uh, the weekend here, so I'm going to be listening to these. Um, so there you go. <laughs> Um, why is it so hard to be a Bitcoiner? Is it hard to be a Bitcoiner? It's not when you're able to have conversations like this with other Bitcoiners and kind of flesh out your thinking to, um, you know, maybe, uh, confirm that you're not completely crazy, <laughs> <laughs> but being a Bitcoiner, especially if you came to Bitcoin as, uh, 
you know, independent of your circle of friends, your family is just lonely Mm -hmm. because it forces you to completely uh, rethink how you live your life, um, how the world works. Um, You're probably reading completely different books Mm -hmm. to to normies. Uh, So it's just lonely because it's a very different path. You know, in the future, I believe this will be the norm. You know, Mm -hmm. kids will be learning about Bitcoin or, or sound money and Bitcoin just happens to be the soundest money, but it's hard being a Bitcoin because it's a lonely journey if you're doing it in isolation. Yeah. So go out and find, you know, your, your other Bitcoiners, you know, go to a meetup, go to a conference, um, you know, I think that's why Bitcoin Twitter is so, uh, people are so active is because the, of what you're describing, which is a little bit of loneliness. You you kind of feel like you're like this strange person that that nobody can understand you, right? And it's a little bit of a, a place to seek uh, salvation online because you can actually interact with people that that understand why you're so excited and hopeful for the future and where this is all going, but. It's a yeah. great point. I never really thought about it being lonely, but I think you're right. I think it, if, if I didn't have yeah. my like online community and Twitter and people that I could talk to, it would be extremely uh, lonely, I think. Yeah. And think about how much of your life is influenced by the values that Bitcoin gives you. Mm-hmm. And then how much of that do you have to hide in public? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Just because it's going to lead to a lot of maybe unnecessary conversations or further alienation. So uncomfortable, very uncomfortable conversations. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And having to, having to hide such a a core part of yourself Mm -hmm. is difficult. You know, you can't then be authentic or vulnerable with the people that you usually are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find myself using the phrase, if you say so (laughs) (laughs) a lot with, uh, you know, close, uh, family, friends, whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's why, like, if you don't, uh, attack that challenge using the B word, but some un- other like fundamental concept that helps them see flaws in the current system, perhaps then they might be willing to search for the solution to that. Uh, so for folk, uh, for folks that are uh, watching this on YouTube, here's the book right here, the Bitcoin handbook. Um, uh, I have it tabbed, highlighted. Uh, like I said at the start of the show, this will sit over on my shelf and I know I'm going to be walking over there from time to time and pulling it off and looking up some of these mental models because you know it, some of these some of these ideas you you think about them, you kind of are aware that that's, a framework, right? But I, for some of them, I just didn't even know that there was like a name to it. And I want to be able to capture it so that I can hand off to somebody. Oh, well, this is the mental model or the idea that, that this is based upon. And then there's like, you could read an entire book on some of these mental models that go into excruciating detail on them, but you do such a great job outlining them and, uh, just the organization, the graphical design work is phenomenal. Uh, hats off to your dad. It was in your DNA, man. Um, but, uh, thank you so much for coming on and Neil, is there any other thing that you want to highlight? Just tell people where they can find the book and, uh, yeah, give a handoff. Yeah, you can uh, find me on Twitter um, in the bio of my Twitter handle. It's Anil said so uh, is a link um, to another page where you can download pretty much all my educational resources for free. They're designed to be very visual, very introductory, normie friendly. Um, send them to loved ones. Uh, it's all free. Spread them around, steal them. Uh, and Preston, I just got to say, man, like I'm such a huge fan of yours, like what you've done for, uh, not just everyone, but for me personally, um, you know, the amount of value you put out into the world without asking for anything in return. I'm just really grateful, um, that we have you. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm thankful we have you as well, putting out amazing material like this. So uh, this was a real pleasure. I look forward to uh, staying in contact and hopefully I meet you at a conference or some meetup someday in the future here. And you know, that was, that was really fun. Thanks, Preston. Look after yourself. You as well, sir.
it'll be this gradual process where the world Bitcoinizes. I think, yeah, there's going to be grassroots Bitcoinization, but I think the big ones is going to be once we have that big blow up of the good old trusted fiat currencies like the British pound and, and the euro and the dollar, like once they become, we get over, say over 50% inflation in a year, who wants to store money in that? Even if it's a derivative, it's like, oh, it's a bond. It's like, yeah, but it pays out in a coin. Like, I don't want that. 